Hello and welcome back to the Brockton Bay Chronicles. My name's Keith, here as always with my friend Andy. We're making our way through Andy's first time reading of Worm by Wild Bo. Hey Andy, what's new and exciting? Well, it appears some poor schmucks volunteered to be in the quarantine zone and uh, <laughs> that's as unpleasant as we expect. So that's interesting to uh, explore in today's stuff. And we'll be reviewing Arc 17, Migration, Chapters 6 to 8. As far as new business, we're looking at possibly taking a break after Arc 18 or 19. And we'll keep you posted on that as our plans firm up. Further new business, Tony may join us for Part 4 of our Arc 18 review, depending on our scheduling. So definitely looking forward to that. We'll be going over questions and comments. And then we also had a poll on the community page, and the question was, what were your overall feelings for ARC-17? And resoundingly, people liked it a lot, 87%. There were 13% that liked it the same as most of the other ARCs, and then we didn't get any, didn't care for it. So that's that's good. It was a very uh, successful ARC, and uh, I'm enjoying it, and looking forward to diving in and talking about it. Yeah, my uh and this will come out during today's review um my opinion on the arc has changed during the course of this experiment that we've been going through. So, um I'm looking forward to some of the questions and comments we've got here and um during our review I'll probably refer back to how my opinion has changed of the, on the arc as we go through it. So, let's begin our questions and comments. First hearing from the Blonde Vampire. Arc 17 is one of my personal favorite parts of Worm. I return to reread sections of it every so often and always find myself drawn in and just rereading the entire arc. It works so well as a self-contained arc and as a piece of, a, of the greater story of Worm. The fact that Wild Bo wrote and released one chapter of this arc a day is still crazy to me even having gotten used to the insane weekly word count output of his later works. These once a day chapter full arcs focused on characters other than the protagonist, like the Slaughterhouse Nine introductions in the book and certain arcs of, in Ward tend to be standout arcs of the story of the tend to be standout arcs of the story as a whole. You want to, uh, my butchering of the commentary aside, you want to you want to respond to uh, the blonde vampire there, bud? Sure. I haven't done a whole lot of writing, but there are times when uh, the train just kind of blows out of the station, you know, and you've got a train of thought and you start writing it down and it just keeps building and building momentum. And it's really fun to read. And I'm not surprised to hear that that's what happened during this arc. It definitely, yeah, it's almost like it was written just like in one setting, you know, mm -hmm. it just, uh, it just all hangs together so well. And it's got kind of a frenetic pace, but you don't feel like, well, I take that back. There is one point I'm going to bring up today where I think there was a, a glitch in the matrix, but um, overall, I, I, I didn't catch anything like that. I was very captivated by the arc. So uh, it's, it's cool to learn that he, he wrote it that way or Wild Bo wrote it that way. Next, we hear from Vale. It, arc 17, could stand alone as its own novella. The horror vibe is intense, the hopelessness even more so. And the group is fantastic to read about. Now we hear from a new contributor, Jamie the Magpie. Congrats on 200 subscribers. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate you uh, extending the congratulations to us. Now we have a comment from Chrysalis. The whole discussion about Taylor's rating is very interesting. It's just speculation, but to the best of my judgment, I think a really close call with Bonesaw either cause a second trigger that we didn't realize was happening because Brian also had a second trigger in the same scene, which I think is unlikely, but not impossible. 
or at the very least, the extreme stress and adversity helped grow her powers. Beyond that specific moment, she has been in a lot of very dire situations in a short period of time, which shows both her tactical improv improvisation and capacity to focus using her swarm despite her injuries and the amount of fine control she's capable of, of course. Now, um, we did get a reply from another contributor, Jackson UB1UV, but uh, due to the possible spoiler nature of the comment, I'm going to defer and not read that one. But uh, thanks for throwing that commentary in there, Chrysalis, giving that to us. We hear now from Johannes E. Really looking forward to Andy's reaction to Arc 17. Matroiska is a Russian nesting doll, a doll inside a doll inside a doll, etc. Gives a sense of how her power works. Thank you, Johannes. That really cleared things up a lot for me and made it much, uh, much easier to understand. Mm, yeah. We hear again from Freak Circus. Cody is immature and insecure, while Krauss is manipulative and deserves to be called out. But the Seamurg is definitely amplifying their jerkish tendencies. One thing I noticed is when the team is deciding who to let go, Cody isn't there, which makes sense, but Krauss is present, which is not fair. Ideally, neither should be there, and a decision should be as objective as possible. By having Krauss there, it's likely they already decided and needed to talk themselves into it rather than genuinely debating it. Good comment, and I think there's, that's a fair statement to, uh, to make. Uh, what do you think, Andy? I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Kraus is definitely kind of a, a reluctant hero. I mean, he's, he's got a pretty high opinion of himself, but it sounds like to a certain extent it's warranted. He also has this manipulative side and, and is kind of a, a jerk. Yeah. But he knows it and he, it's almost like he's kind of accepted it, but he is, you know, he's trying to, do what's best for the team. And I think he is biased in this uh, with his relationship with Noel, but yeah, I'd, I'd say Kraus manipulated that by being there. You know, it's hard to, he was able to make his sales pitch and, and as Chris or freak circus is pointing out, Cody wasn't there to produce a counter argument. So, but it's just the kind of thing you would expect from somebody like Kraus. So not, not too surprising, but I, I like the, the dynamics, the interplay, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a very neat side or perspective on the story. It's not all just who has what powers and let's go blast this and who who's in danger and that kind of thing. You've got this, these personalities mixing in. I think that's pretty neat. I agree. We hear again from Chrysalis. Oh, we're getting into one of my favorite arcs. Not so much on first read, but on reread, there is so much here, both explanations about a lot of what's been going on with the travelers thus far and rather impressive amount of foreshadowing of things to come. Having the POV of Trickster is really interesting. It's part of why I really liked having different perspectives on the story from his, pardon me, from his perspective, his actions are justified. The best course of action, really. He is very good at finding a way to present what he wants as just what's best, the best thing for everyone. And he's right often enough that it does make him the leader, but wrong often enough for the rest of the travelers to have no confidence in him at all. Explains a lot about Ballistic's words earlier when he and Taylor went to see Parian. Besides, we also get why Trickster is an inst is insufferable a lot of the time. He might have taken point in the travelers when they needed it, but it is mostly because it aligns with his own goals. He is mostly selfish at the end of the day. Um, yeah, he, he stepped up when, when the group needed it, when they first arrived. And 
just kind of defaulted into to being the leader. Um, I don't know. I think if Cody hadn't been a had been a little less abrasive, perhaps he would have had a, a case to make for becoming the leader of the squad. But um, he had his own issues. Uh, what do you think about the, the comment from Chrysalis here, bud? I think this is a really good point, a uh, number of points. I think that when you're you're in that late teen, young adult age, nobody is really sure whether they're a, a leader or a follower or, you know, that's at least I remember, you know, talking to people about it at that age wondering, am I going to get this shining light at some point that says, oh, you're a leader, you know, and, and it's hard to know when something is going to kick in. I can remember being on a basketball team in high school when we were horrible. We we were a very small school and we were playing all schools that were way bigger than us. We got beat on a, on a regular basis. And I remember joking around with somebody after the game and this one guy got all upset at me and he was trying to be the leader and mm-hmm. put us in his place and everything. He was a year older than us and yelling at me, you know, hey, this is take this seriously, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, the game's over. Being all mad about it at this point doesn't help anybody. We need to just get that awful taste out of our mouths and move on. You know, and I I just I just got mad. I didn't want to be a leader. I just got mad that he got in my face about it. So mm-hmm. I yelled back at him. And later on my friend was like, Can't believe you yelled back at that guy. He's like, <laughs> we could kick our butts, you know. So I think it's it's just one of those things where nobody's everybody's trying to figure out where they're where they fit in the dynamics, where they fit in the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. But in general, people who have some kind of goal, something in mind, they're going to kind of fall into a leadership role because they are driving for that. And if it, it's a very fine line, it can go badly where it, it becomes this manipulative thing where it's like, well, yeah, this is going to suck for you, but I, my goal's over here. So sorry. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to get the, the bad deal here, or it can go well where somebody is is trying to balance out getting to the goal trying to convince people it's the right goal being open to you know being convinced that maybe it needs to change that kind of thing but those people end up being they carry a huge burden right because you're mm-hmm. not only trying to kind of go out your dream but you're trying to make sure you're not crushing anybody else's at the same time so it's a real juggling act and uh not, I, very few people are are up for that, especially at that age. So this came across as something that was very realistic to me. I could very believable Mm -hmm. that you would have this person that's like, ah, this is where I want to go. And yeah, uh, sorry, you you don't seem like you know where you want to go. So come along or get out the car. (laughs) Yeah. Good way to put it. (laughs) We do have a question from Megafire seven that I'm going to hold off, hold off reading until we get to right before your overall impression sections. I think that will be the more appropriate location for that question. And so with that, we are ready to move on to our review and we are going to be finishing the back half of arc 17, beginning with chapter six. And I want to start off reading this section, this uh, one paragraph, because it really does kind (laughs) of, it sets the, the stage for what's to come here. And it starts off, we have to tell them, Krauss murmured. He and Jess were in the kitchen of a stranger's house, using that stranger's utensils to prepare their food. It felt odd, invasive, except it's not like they'll be coming back anytime soon. And uh, that's that's where our crew is. They're set up in this place. They're kind of using it as a base camp in a not just a stranger's house, but on a strange earth. And they're trying to figure out what to do. And Krauss and Jess are debating when and how to tell uh, tell the others the truth about just how messed up their situation is. Yeah, this what well, Jess and Krauss know definitely takes it up to a, a whole other level, and it seems kind of like the worst of all worlds, if you will. You know, I, you have like the post apocalyptic stories where there's something horrible has happened and people are just 
surviving by the skin of their teeth and slogging along trying to trying to get somewhere mm-hmm. or you have ones where there's some kind of devastation going on and and you're caught in the middle of it and that kind of thing but this one is weird where it's almost like they're in this mini pocket that's post apocalyptic they're quarantined and they're totally taken out of their world and yet there are people just on the other side having a sandwich on the other side of the fence right. you know drinking coffee chat with family whatever <laughs> and it's like wait a minute how did how did i end up on this side what could i could we like re-roll this where i'm <laughs> the guy over there cuz this this is not cool yeah it puts added tension and anxiety into the whole equation because it's like well even if we get a b c d and e figured out mm-hmm. we're still here inside the bed <laughs> Yeah. Or or we're on a different world. You know, there's there's always this next thing that, oh, if we could get that done too. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And then yeah, and it turns out a bunch of folks don't even know how bad it is. And it's like, well, okay, you thought it was bad. Wait, let me tell you, it's worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before we get back into the personalities, Jess brings up as she and Krauss are, are talking about the situation, Jess brings up what went down when uh, I believe it was Professor Haywire uh, cracked the door mm. between Earth Aleph and um, and Earth Bet? Uh, what did you think of that paragraph where she laid out the paranoia and the possible ramifications of uh, two parallel worlds going to war? That definitely rang true for me. You know, anytime you read about alien races maybe coming to the earth or whatever in sci-fi books Mm -hmm. or even uh colonization on our own planet yeah people show up and they just immediately say oh they're they're tougher than us we should go back and and buff up and then come back and take over or let's just take over now and take all their stuff they're not using it (laughs) or they're not using it right Mm -hmm. and so you know you could definitely imagine that uh there'd be this almost like Cold War, where the two two Earths know about each other, but, you know, they know that just like there were power grabs on, on each planet, what's more likely, it's like, oh, well, we don't even have anything in common with them. They have a whole different history and stuff, so we got no qualms about stealing their stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And, oh, look, they haven't discovered that uranium mine over here. Let's send a, a team in there and and dig it up under cover of darkness and, and just uh, take some capes with us and just take the mountain back to our place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whether it's Earth bad or Earth LF, they're still people and humans are going to human. And so, yeah, if there were, <laughs> yeah. A, if there were a, a conflagration between the two worlds, it wouldn't end till they were both in a smoldering ruin. I would imagine. But anyway, Marissa comes downstairs after having popped into the shower and it's like, hey, uh, they offer up some food. Krauss and Jess were making pancakes. And while they were having their conversation about what to do and when to do it, uh, moving forward a little bit, their hand gets forced. Uh, Marissa and the others turn on the television and there's scenes playing from the, the Seamurg attack. And so it's, you got to tell him, (laughs) you got to tell him. And so Jess takes, uh, pardon me, uh, Krauss takes Jess into the front room with everyone, turns down the volume on the television and tells them the truth. And this was kind of a, I mean, we we're seeing this from, from Krauss's POV. So he's, he feels that it's better for him to take the heat. For the the rest of the group to panic at him rather than panic at him and Jess. Uh, I kind of agree. We don't know that Cody would have gone off the handle at Jess to the extent he did at Kraus because there's other stuff going on there. But I still can imagine him being completely unglued after a fashion. Yeah, I saw this as kind of the uh, like the drill sergeant uh, type scenario where. You know, they show in, in uh, boot camp, the drill sergeant is just a total pain in the neck so that everybody 
hates that person. It becomes kind of like a lightning rod. They can focus all their anger and unhappiness on one person and it helps them to push through all the horrible stuff and, and overlook to a certain extent when their co-recruits are, are messing up or, you know, they don't take out as much of the, the stuff on them. And so I think Krause has taken one for the team a little bit here. Yeah. Who knows what it would have been if Jess was involved too, but it would have fractured the team. I think even more, there would have been more, well, what else are the, either of them keeping from us? You know, what if, oh, look, they're talking together over there again. What are they talking about? So I think this was a good call. We'll see how it plays out. After Cody and Kraus have their fisticuffs and Kraus kicks Cody off of him and he hurls invectives at him across the room, things finally settle down. Kraus turns back up the uh, volume on the television and we get the rest of the news report. Talks about how uh, how the battle of the, with the Seamorg went. We got a quote from, uh, I think it's from Mirrodin in here. The news commenter mentions where some of the uh, evacuees can go to for aid. And it's a, it's a local hospital that doesn't exist in their Madison. And so that's where they decide they're going to retreat to to try to get some help for Luke's leg and for Noel's internal injuries. They split up into a couple of groups and they go out looking for cars to uh, to ferry themselves over to to the hospital. Kraus ends up with Marissa. We get a, a another opportunity to get a look at the goings on that makes that person that we see later you know, that we've seen so far in the story. Um, you think back to how hesitant Sundancer as a cape was to mm. use her power. I mean, granted, it's an incredibly dangerous power, but she's not wanting to be in the spotlight like this. Um, well, am I misstating that? I mean, um, her mother, her, her relationship I, with her mother sucked. How much did could that have played in her not wanting to use her power as often. I think that that's there. I, I would agree with that. I didn't catch it on the first time I was reading through it, but as we're talking about it, there's definitely a, a element of performance anxiety, mm -hmm. but I guess I focus more on how, you know, Krauss was trying to figure out what buttons the Seamurg was trying to push with everybody and trying to get a handle on what might have been, you know, if there was an underlying plan or if, mm -hmm. seeing how they were, you know, getting data points, as he says. And so he's getting the points where it seems like certain people are being focused in one way and certain others are being focused in another way. Let me, um, let me ask you this. Was that a fool's errand on his part? And he's new to this world. He's never dealt with the inbringers. All he's de dealt with or knows is from what he's gleaned from Jess and maybe the mm. occasional thing that popped up on the news in, in, in their world. Is he is he trying to figure out what the Seamurg is doing? Is that a fool's errand on his part? Or is it just, hey, I got to try to figure things out? Well, I, I think it is in the end a fool's air because, you know, and they even comment on that later, how you can drive yourself crazy thinking about, well, am I doing this because it's part of the predestined thing or I'm being manipulated or am I doing it because I want to do it? Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, you can just end up crouching in a corner, not doing anything and then wondering if that's part of the plan. But I think in his defense, they're all gamers, right? And, yeah. and gaming is definitely uh, got a finite decision tree, right? There's always some reason that something happened. And a lot of times you're trying to solve puzzles in games. You're trying to figure out, oh, when I flip this lever, that light went on over there. Or when I crossed through this threshold, that alarm went off over there or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you try to build up those data points. What happens if I'm not carrying my weapon when I go through or whatever? And so I, 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 it seems natural for him to try to do it. And anytime we're struck with a huge amount of uncertainty, it's just human nature to try to make things make sense. Yeah. 
you know, try to put things together. But yeah, in the end, I don't think there's any way to figure this out. So as we're moving further down into the into the chapter, we're staying with Kraus and Marissa. They're having no luck finding keys for cars that are located out on the street, and they end up going into a hotel, and they luck into what appears to be a, a, a I can't remember, it's like the valet where they had the keys. Right. Yeah, okay. And they, they luck, lucked into that drawer and uh, found a couple of vehicles and headed back to the house where they were staying. Well, they were supposed to meet up with Cody and Oliver. Right. And then okay. when for a couple, they tried for a little bit and then it finally clicked for Krause that he's like, oh, yeah, I'm sure Cody went off, and did his own thing just to piss me off. And so they hustle back and sure enough, Cody's already there. Yeah, because he's trying to he's he's looking for the vials. Right. Cody found the car early and went back to the house to go find the vials. And Kraus, yeah. Kraus and Noel, pardon me, Kraus and Marissa had found their cars. And then, as you said, it clicked for, for Kraus what happened. Um, I mean, Cody is just, he's being painted to be one giant jerk here. He's pissed off because Jess and Kraus say that they des- destroyed the canisters of the, uh, the formulas, which wasn't true. But Luke is like, hey, you lied to my face, Cody. What are you call- trying to call out Kraus for? Hmm. And he's right. Kraus, on the other hand, at the moment, calls Cody out and says, look, uh, I'm gonna, my concern is getting people care. And if you're standing in my way, then I'm going to have to run through you, essentially. Yeah, I think the fact that we kind of cut Kraus some slack, though, we need to cut Cody some slack. So, hmm. you know, he at the start of the story was part of this cool gaming group. They were looking at going national or international or whatever. And then it turns out they pull the rug out from under him. He's not part of the group anymore. And then their whole building gets thrown into another world. And it's just one crappy thing after another. And the person who seems to be leading everything is the person who basically kicked him out or Mm -hmm. engineered him being kicked out of the group. And so, what do you do if you're in a group in a, a gaming environment and you're kind of tail end Charlie, you know, you're not the one that's really doing anything. You get a buff weapon or you get some great armor, you get some, some new stuff and then you surge back to the front, right? And then you're, you're leading the group, you know, it's, it's, it's your group again. And so I think that's all that he's looking at. I don't, I think he's justified in thinking that Kraus is a jerk. I think he's, uh, He's just grasping at something and and he just found out they're in this other world and who knows what could come out of these vials. Could be something really good, could help everybody. He could be the hero. So he's willing to take that chance. But he he does take kind of a jerky way of doing it. I think you've got a very valid point. I would I desperately wish I could remember how I felt about Cody in my first read. I have no specific recollection of my feelings toward him. So um, you know, whereas I may be leaning team Kraus, I may be coming off that way this time around. I really would like to have a conversation yeah. with my earlier self and say, figure out what I was thinking about this guy back then. Anyway, so the team, uh, loads up and they head to the hospital, the St. Mary's and it's a whole thing. <laughs> the administrative problem that they run into where the uh this ddid i believe it is protocol kind of traps them and this if you recall i think it was the the chapter where mirden and arms master showed up and they were talking about how the president was going to initiate this and mirden was saying this is a bad idea i'm going on record now i'm going to remind you guys every chance i get what did you think of this thing as it laid out, as the, the kids come to discover what, what's going to have to happen to them between the paperwork that the the front desk gave them and the information the AI stated to Kraus? Well, okay. Rant warning. Um, okay, go for it. <laughs> this seems like a typical government short-sighted deal. 
they perceive a, a problem, they think it's a simple solution, they throw together a bunch of stuff without any idea how to do the infrastructure, how, how it's going to affect people's lives, how it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. Rarely are these problems as as simple as as they're supposed to be. You and I both grew up down near the border, and I'm sure you saw, as I did, how stark a difference there is. You can move one mile, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and you go from you go from a first world country to a third world country. It's just unbelievable. People are playing golf on one side of the border where I grew up, and then on the other side of the border, they have dirt floors in a hut. It's just unbelievable. And so then you know, people get all upset that it's like, well, why would they come here? Well, why wouldn't anybody come here? I mean, yeah. You could work as a groundskeeper on that golf course a mile from your home and make 10 times easily what you make in your own town. Who wouldn't jump at that? You know, and, and who are we to blame them that there's some arbitrary line that got drawn with the Gadsden purchase back, you know, during the Mexican-American War at the conclusion of it? Mm -hmm. And they happen to be on the wrong side of it. You know, if they had just been a mile further north, they'd be in the promised land. There'd be no problem. So this definitely seems like one of those things, just a knee jerk reaction by the government. It's like, who is going to be doing all it? Where are they going to find all the people to do all this therapy? Mm -hmm. There's just no way that they're going to manage it. Just the same way we have now where we can't, we get all these people needing asylum and coming to our country and we have no way to try to help them. You know, there's, we're so understaffed, even the folks that do want to go the legal route as it's laid out now and becoming citizens, it's like a decade, you know, for some of these folks, uh, to try to get there because there's so few people helping out with the system. So I, I totally get it. It's a horrible thing. The government has to step in somehow, but it does definitely seem like, uh, trying to put a bandaid on, uh, decapitation victim you know it's just <laughs> it's it's not gonna work so and rant <laughs> all right yeah the hospital as you noted uh, severely understaffed because there was only a, a handful of folks brave enough to volunteer to come into the quarantine zone from outside a couple of uh, nurses in the facility take uh, come up to the group they take noel in for immediate care because she's the the one in, in most dire need of urgent care. Krauss goes over this information with the rest of the squad while Noel is getting looked at. They're screwed, basically. There's no way they can mm. forge. They're, they're a bunch of kids. They, they, they don't know how to forge ID to, to try to get out. Uh, they don't Technically, they don't exist on this earth, and they, they don't have anyone that they can contact for help. So once the nurse comes out to tell Krauss and the rest of the group how poor a shape Noel is in, well, from that moment forward, all bets are off as far as Krauss is concerned. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. There's every avenue has been cut off. You know, Jess even mentions that, well, if we bring up that we're from the other earth and that kicks in a whole mm -hmm. other system of, Gitmo almost level type things, you yeah. Know, where it's like, oh my gosh! So we have we have nothing we can do, and we unfortunately had to go to the ER not that long ago. And even just the usual insurance stuff is a hassle when mm -hmm. when you're here. So I can't imagine how bad this is. And yeah, you're like, it's the equivalent of well, I got mugged right before I got here, and the <laughs> person who is injured is has amnesia, so. She's not going to know any of her stuff. Oh, and my bank is right here in the quarantine zone and they were destroyed. You know, it's just like <laughs> worst possible scenario. And they're expected to figure out how to navigate. So, yeah, they're they got no cards left to play. now. They got to go the nuclear option. Roll the dice and see what happens. And that's exactly what Krauss does. He doesn't even wait to hear the rest of the information from the medical pro who's come to tell them about Noel's condition. He bolts out, heads back to the house. It's the house next door to the one they were staying at. That's where they hid the canisters. And he starts reading through the papers on what each canister contains. He kind of wryly notes that they don't even tell him specifically what each vial of, of the superhero serum will do. And it's just kind of a, 
a crap shoot. So he does this. Let's let's step back to how far back do I want to go? Let's look at our previous two examples of a cauldron capes getting their powers. We have Alexandria and we have Battery. Hmm. And each of them, well, pardon me. We know Battery had to go through a, a whole series of tests before she was even given her formula. Now, Alexandria, this may not be the best comparison because she was on the front end of this whole thing. But once Cauldron started getting their act together, I guess you could say, uh, where they were actually directing what they believed would give the best results when they started laying out their formulas. Yeah, you didn't just hand it to Joe Blow off the street. You had to make sure they were mentally sound and and uh, there weren't any physical issues. Or if, if there were, you knew about the physical issues. This is just an awful scenario. So Krauss is going to take something. And he's going to grab something else and go take it and give it to Noel. This has Seymour fingerprints all over it. Yeah, and he, he even says that, you know, well played. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh my gosh, you can make it so that we only have one choice and it's it's totally, totally stacked against us. And we have no idea what's going to happen, but we don't have any other choice. So... It's pretty bad. And, uh, you know, he's just trying to make sense of all these codes and, mm -hmm. you know, very brief one word descriptions of what stuff might be. You know, some of them have mixtures and stuff. I guess they're all mixtures, but some of them have more of a, a thing than another. And, and yeah, the other factor that we found out, you know, through the other parts of the story was that, yeah, you're supposed to be in as, calm a state of mind as possible right when you're taking this right and and it's like oh wow yeah this is this is great it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> i'm all i'm here on my lawn chair on, on alternate earth in somebody's backyard in a quarantine zone i'm totally relaxed i'm ready so yeah the the girl the, the girl who's possibly the most important person in my life at this moment She's not dying. Huh? Why would I be upset and, and bent out of shape for an, an, an emotional wreck right now? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maximum chaos as far as Krauss's life is concerned. Uh, we got another trigger vision. Thoughts on that? It was interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I guess how I'm seeing this, because there's there's variants, variations. It's like when people dream, you know, they they're getting some kind of input. And their their brain is trying to make sense of it, and so he's seeing it as like mobile crystals, and they seem slightly maybe anthropomorphic. They're they're moving around. They maybe have eyes sometimes, and but he's seeing it looks like different planets and going through space and stuff. So there's some similarities there. But yeah, these are I I, I love these things just because. I feel a little like crowds, I guess, you know, we have mm -hmm. these limited data points, very vague and, and just some details kind of tossed around in there. And we're, at least I am as a puzzle solver, like, well, what does that mean? Okay. Does that align with this? You know, am I, am I thinking too much into it? And so this, I really like these All right. uh, trigger, trigger visions. Let's go there a little bit with you. Seeing this and then skipping ahead to what he went through when Noel drank the formula. How do these trigger visions play into your perceptions of what may be going on with these quote unquote otherworldly beings who you've speculated? This added or subtracted or altered your opinion on that or just kind of status quo based on what limited stuff we got in this arc? Right. Um, I think it kept it pretty much the same. I didn't, I didn't have anything in here where I was like, Oh wow, that's way different than I expected. Okay. It's showing that there's some kind of beings that they're interacting and traveling through space, apparently possibly parallel space. They're seeing different planets and, and somehow connecting with them that there's uh, 
you know, huge amounts of time pass. He says he senses that years have passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems it seems very similar. It's just like I said, maybe his perceptions are a little different. The way his brain is interpreting it okay. is coming across a little different. But otherwise, it seems like the underlying core of it is is similar enough for me. So no, no real revelation. Still status quo as far as that goes on your thinking at the moment. I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So Cody, Oliver, and Marissa show up at the house. It's too late. He's already taken the uh, the formula. Cody, again, is pissed off. He doesn't try to... He, he's angry. He's mad. He His new point of anger is the fact that he realizes that the rest of the group, is, as he put it, is going to accept this. Mm. They're going to let Kraus get away with this. Kind of a pity party. He thinks everybody else is going to accept this. Kraus uses his newfound power, learning how to crawl before he can walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just is jumping right into it and, you know, seeing these kind of bands connecting things and, and realizing that somehow he's able to transport things, transport himself. Mm -hmm. And I totally get that. It's, it's like the new, new tennis shoes effect. But uh, on steroids, you know, it's like when you're a kid and you're like, oh, wait, I got to try this out. Can I jump higher now? <laughs> you and like so how <laughs> um, you like Wild Bo's descriptions here? Kraus feeling pressure. And then, as you noted, the uh, the cord between items. You like how it was laid out? I didn't really get the pressure of it so much, but. You know, as as they as it goes forward, he says he detects these presences. So it's it's mm -hmm. more like he's got like short range sensors that are that are picking up all the things around him that could be manipulated, and and then he's he's able to ascertain or assess whether they're uh, similar enough or compatible for moving around. So yeah, I think I think that's good. I like the. I liked him seeing the connections between stuff. And then he, as he started to see how to say, oh, you know, I'm not the same shape or I'm not, I'm smaller. I need to get a little bigger, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing. And so I thought it was well crafted. And then, you know, I think it's, he notices pretty quickly that he's also been healed by, by drinking it. So, oh, right. Yeah. His hand, that's a pretty cool side benefit. Yeah. He's, his impaled hand doesn't hurt anymore. So, mm -hmm. So he bails. He grabs one of the formulas and he heads back to the hospital. Krauss is desperate. As I noted, the girl he cares for the most is dying. And so that's what's driving him here to do this. And he gets back to her room, talks her into taking this. Noel wasn't really wasn't on board. Is that fair to say initially? Oh, for sure. But she doesn't really understand that there are lots of layers of dog do under this top turd, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, yeah, you know, you've got another surgery coming up. You might not make it, but guess what? If you do, then we've got all these under other wonderful prizes behind door number three here. So <laughs> in this case, I think Kraus is right to try to convince her that this is a way to go. He just saw that his hand was healed. He knows they've got to somehow find a way to get beyond the quarantine zone. And if she's in a hospital, even if she survives, that's not going to happen. And then they're going to have all these questions to answer. So yeah, it's the crappy situation, but that's the best thing is for her to give, give it a try. But I think she should have committed and go on, gone all in. I don't think drinking half was a good choice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to that with you later on. Uh, so <laughs> we end the chapter with Kraus thinking to himself, if this doesn't work, I'll take the blame. I'm okay with being the bad guy. He thought just so long as you get to live and uh, it's keep Noel alive at all cost, and all other considerations are secondary. Later on, that comes to not be the best way to look at things, I don't think. But huh. as you said, he helps her drink. As we're moving into chapter seven, he helps her drink this thing. 
And her transition is nowhere near as straightforward as his. The heart monitor is beating erratically. Uh, sometimes it flatlines. Sometimes it comes out, comes back, blowing the doors off. And Noel is screaming and howling and in pain. And during this whole time, Kraus does have a couple of more trigger visions, as we talked about uh, a little bit ago. Yeah, the consuming the half of formula. Do you think that had anything to do with her struggle? I think so. Yeah. It seems like these are, are really fine tuned, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, they're tailored for certain people. They're supposed to be taken, you know, in as calm a state as possible, as healthy a state as possible. And they are custom formulized. And it's just like antibiotics, right? You don't just take a couple until you feel better. You take the whole bottle. Right. So who knows? Hopefully it's it's fully mixed, but maybe it isn't. And if you drink half, are you getting the same percentage? Or are you getting more of one part and like none of the balance part? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, if you're going to do it, just commit. Just do the whole thing. Bite the bullet. It's awful pill, but it's just you're just adding adding even more risk by half half baking it. So, I think that contributed. I think also her dire physical state, having gone through one surgery, still having her body all messed up, needing another surgery. I think that that definitely contributes to how bad it goes as well. And her mental state. I meant to ask Tony, she, if you recall from the previous chapter, Marissa said that she met Noel in counseling. And mm. um, when Noel, right before she drinks the formula, Noel talks to, to Krauss about the irony of her situation of having, ending up having a colostomy bag. I All think right. we can presume that she had some kind of eating disorder. Hmm. Uh, I think there's enough there to say that, and I don't think that should be any kind of a spoiler. Again, this could be one thing that I should know, and I can't remember exactly for sure. So her mental state is sketch. Mm, yeah, The injuries could be another issue, and on top of that, the consuming only half a formula. So there's there's a lot of stuff that we think could be working against her. Yeah, and she's on morphine. So, Mm -hmm. you know, who knows if there's drug interactions or whatever. So it's just, there's this, yeah, this is just uh, a recipe for disaster. And that's what we get. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. It came out just like the picture. Look. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, jeez. While Noel is going through all this, Kraus ends up fighting a PRT guard. Mirden shows up with a bunch of uh, people from his crew, including this anomaly guy, which was had a pretty cool power. I think that's like his own personal black hole that he was rolling around with. Mirden is going to banish him to a, to another dimension. Kraus gets before Mirden shows up. Kraus does get the crap beat out of him by that guard, but it was, it was a, a life and death struggle. I think the guard probably would have shot him and justifiably. So as far as he knew, he was a, a rogue villain cape. Right. Yeah, I mean, he's, everybody's on edge. You know, this is this horrible quarantine situation. Everybody knows the Seamberg is is mucking with people and who knows how that's going to look. And then all of a sudden, somebody in one of the rooms starts freaking out medically and somebody is fighting to take a gun away from the guard. So, yeah, save a taxpayer dollar here. This is, (laughs) this has Seamberg fingerprints all over it. So, right. I think he definitely would have shot him if he had the chance. Yeah. Um, let's see here. This Mirden, we get a little more from him. Uh, what's your impression of Mirden as a as a cape, as a as a good guy? Pseudo Gandalf. Um, yeah, yeah, I think he's pretty good. You know, I think it's funny that they say he's got a beard, but it's not white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh right. man! <laughs> um, so he's more like Radagast the Brown, I guess. I don't mm. know, but uh, that's that's me. He's not like that, but yeah, I think I think that's pretty cool. It it's always jarring to have 
kind of the science stuff and the tech stuff and stuff, and then have somebody have kind of more of a magical type power. But I think Wombo does a good job of mixing that in, and it doesn't seem out of place. It still it still works. And so yeah, think I like about him as a as a cape. This comparison just came to me. Uh, not quite as trippy as uh, Glastic Winye, but from that same side of mm. the uh, the street where the capes believe that their their power borders on the mystical, the magical, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. And again, you know, just like we're seeing with the trigger event or the trigger vision, mm-hmm. where people are coming from when they when they trigger is probably going to impact a lot how they view what's going on, right? You've got to try to integrate what's happening to you with what your psyche already has, what your personality already has. So mm-hmm. If you're already kind of leaning that way or believing in magic or whatever, then chances are, you know, that's kind of how it's going to go. If you're somebody that that really believes that technology is going to solve all the world's problems, then you're maybe going to go more for kind of a tinker thing. So I think there is a big a big part of that. But it makes sense that there won't be many of the magical people because that's most people don't believe in any of that kind of stuff. And I, I tend to, I tend to not believe it either, but I, I go with what Asimov said, you know, that, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is going to appear as magic. Right. Yeah. To, uh, pe- people who don't understand it. So, you know, there's, there's so much stuff that goes on in the universe, you know, like quantum entanglement or stuff that just doesn't make any sense to us. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, well, how do you explain that? Some people just try to fit it into a different, a different framework. Yeah. So Noelle finally gets through her, her transition. Pardon me. This was right before Mirton and the rest of them show up. She gets dressed and Krauss is trying to figure out after his battle with the uh, PRT officer, how to get them out of there. Then they have the fight with Mirton and them and they escape. He swaps out a couple of cops. They hop in a vehicle and then boom, they're on their way. And they head back to the head back to the house with the rest of the team. So the rest of the team is there and uh Noel's better. And they decide that right, they're gonna drink the rest of the vials. Cody's power, limited time travel, or not teleportation, but time travel, and he's he's thinking that it can counter Krauss's power pretty well. And we get that whole scene of him taking a swing at Krauss and and several resets. A bit much from Cody or just him him venting appropriately, uh, given their situation. What do you think? I, I think it's appropriate. I, you and I have talked about this from a, a sports standpoint. And, and you've coached a lot and, you know, there are those folks that are just gifted in an otherworldly way mm-hmm. and everything comes easy to them. And, you know, if they, if they don't have a solid foundation, they can end up being pretty hard to deal with. And then you have the folks that are just having to work their butt off to make the cut. And they're they're there early. They stay late. They do extra study. They watch film. You know, if it's a football thing, they're trying to figure out what the other team's doing. You know, and and I've always been more. I wasn't blessed with with any super skills or anything. And so, you know, I think Cody is definitely one of those people that wasn't blessed. Mm-hmm. And so he's just he's just trying things over and over again. He's trying to get better, just the same way. You know, if you were trying to get through a, a firefight in a in a first person shooter game, you know, and you keep getting shot, it's like, well, what what I do wrong last? All right, I gotta I gotta save those health bonuses. I gotta go in and shoot a few things, come back out, heal up, go back in, lure them over here, go around the back way. So he's just, he, I think he's just trying stuff over and over again. So I don't I don't fault him for that. I think that's just him being Cody. You know that he that's just what he's had to do to try to 
get better. And that's his strategy. Kind of his default. Exactly. Yeah. Immediately after Noel had drunk the formula and before the fight with Mirden uh, got underway, Krauss asked her if he, if she felt any different. And the only thing that she said was it seemed like her skin, where her clothes touched her skin, it felt like it was fizzing or bubbling a little bit, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And so nothing, nothing new as far as they know it as of this moment. Noel doesn't seem to have any powers. The only thing that happened is she, she healed up, which is that in itself is a blessing. And so, Hey, we're, we're good to go. We've got Krause's power. Um, the rest of the team is going to take, uh, Oliver takes a half, there's pardon me, the remaining half dose. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, Luke, Jess take the the rest of it. Wait, am I forgetting something? Oh, Marissa, of course. So, as we're moving toward the end of the chapter, the group is on the road. We get a bit of a time skip and the team is out of Madison. They're in their vehicles and they're heading down the road somewhere. And this is where we start getting into kind of uh, some, some Lovecraft territory. Boy, this situation with Noel, we finally see what happened with what the uh, formula really did to her. Pretty, pretty gross. There's just no way to put it. Yeah, I, I got to jump back to for two different things, though. Sure. Um, one was that uh, when they were leaving the hospital, Noel cut her hand on the glass getting right. out of the window. But by the time they got in the cop car, it healed up already. So something's going on there where her body is is repairing or, or doing something at a super fast rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second thing is my one gripe in this oh, arc, right. mm-hmm. and that that is that they're as they're driving along there, it's a dark and it's rainy and snowy mixed, which is a horrible thing to drive in, as all of us who lived in Flagstaff for any amount of time can attest. Yeah, but but he mentions that the sun was rising, but then a little bit later he says uh, he smoked a cigarette watching the sunset. <laughs> And it's oh, like, is a discontinuity in there? Yeah. So, but that's totally understandable knowing that he wrote this <laughs> whole yeah. thing in a day. Yeah, but, we're, uh, we'll, we'll forgive that. <laughs> yeah, you know what? exactly. Let me take a second. And so as someone who doesn't really do a lot, uh, the massive amount of reading that you do or or like Tony does, and Tony's been so deep into to Wild Bull's work. I don't all often step back and appreciate just how massive this story is. I mean, you know, mm. us, you and I going through this thing and me dissecting notes and stuff like that and preparing for each week. I'm finally getting a, an appreciation for the scale that this work actually is. You know what I mean? And oh, for sure. And and so, yeah, I don't think I I point that out enough. That, you know, just kind of a huh. just kind of a noob in the superhero world and enjoy the occasional good DC or Marvel uh, film. But this work that he's just rolled out over the course of the year and a half or however long it was, it took him to, to get this thing pumped out. And then as we as it was uh, alluded to his putting out a, a chapter a day for this arc, I uh, just really pumps up the amount of uh of awe i have for the story as a whole you know oh for sure and you know you read a book that you buy from you know the nameless giant corporate entity that sells everything on the planet or Mm -hmm. you know you pick up a book or whatever it's it's gone through a whole publishing cycle right it's been rewritten edited you know all sorts of stuff done to it over and over again redraft whatever Mm -hmm. and you can still find mistakes in those, you know, they get, they get a word wrong or whatever. And so for this to be one of the very few things I've found in here where it's like, Oh, well that, that was, yeah. That kind of an oopsie. Work. Yeah. It's like, well, gosh, give the guy a break. You know, it's not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like random house was there with their cadre of people checking every I and dotting every, uh, dotting every I and crossing every T. So. Yeah. I think that, See, and I've never actually read um, the Lord of the Rings. Mm. 
the size of this being so intimidating, it really doesn't help me want to read that book. <laughs> those books because <laughs> this is scary enough because of its massive size so uh you know i don't know i may just stick to the the films uh, peter jackson did pretty good from what i've been told so you know, i'll just i'll just stick with the videos anyway the hobbit was a bit much he kind of kind of went overboard with that but uh mm -hmm. but yeah lord of the rings was almost spot on i was as a long time tolkien fan mm -hmm. i was i was really happy with that all right so let's dig back into this unsettling scene that takes place in the restroom at the rest stop at the restaurant. And just, there. just as a little aside, yeah. you know, what is it about being in a restaurant restroom that just always makes things worse? You know, it just seems <laughs> like it, it's just like, you know, when the character goes in there, you're like, Oh, something bad's going to happen. Dude's going to pull a gun, mm -hmm. you know, dead body's going to be in a stall, something bad. Yeah. It's going to explode, whatever. Yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing good like, is going to uh, take place there. It's like the cat going through the ship and alien, you know, it's just like, oh, oh no, here it comes. <laughs> right. Oh. Um, This is ugly. This was just bad. Tell me what you felt about this thing. It starts off pretty well. I mean, you know, they're, they get there, they're, they're, they're parking. Krause is having a smoke. Everybody goes inside and then boom. Yeah, then Marissa comes out and he's thinking, oh, yeah, well, I should probably head in. And then he saw how how freaked out she is. And he's mm -hmm. like, oh, my gosh, you know, what's going on? Because Noel was at death's door not that long ago. Right. And who knows? You know, it maybe only taking half the thing, only push the clock back a little bit. Maybe she's not fully healed. Who who knows what could be happening? But it's it's got to be bad for Marissa to look that way. So, yeah, she gets in there and Noel's freaking out. And yeah, when I first read this, I kind of had flashbacks to that one of the uh, Slaughterhouse Nine that had mm -hmm. the eyes all over. And I was like, oh, my gosh, did she? Get oh, crawler. Yeah. Did she get did she get the crawler mix? Oh, I mean, geez, I didn't even think about that. Oh, man. Because that would just be bad. And we knew it was it was something pretty messed up because she was in a double locked room in a in a bomb shelter mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it smelled like a, a slaughterhouse in there so we knew things were bad but yeah just having this funky eye poking out of your leg is uh oh. it's pretty gross yeah and as wild bow wrote it how it uh the eye it darted from uh gazing at one team member to another and then it settled on kraus accusatory Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> Appreciate that <laughs> description. I, I really needed that. Uh, okay, and on that happy note, we'll move on to the final chapter of our <laughs> seventeen. <laughs> oh gosh, so well, chapter know, eight, and we get a time skip. It's been a period of time. I think uh, over a year now, and we find Trickster preparing to meet. A super local Boston supervillain named Accord. I think, let me see here. Anal retentive doesn't begin to describe Accord, I don't think. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, he, I, I tried to cut him some slack thinking it went along with his power a little bit. You know, it's mm -hmm. the best way to try to predict things or make things work out the way you want is to have things, everything in its place. Right. Yeah. If this person is the best person at that spot, that's the job they're doing. You know, if this is the best tool for this, you're using that tool. But he is very particular. And I think that they use that. Fair word enough. Right here. Um, yeah. To the point it's, it's a little bit over the top or maybe a lot over the top, but you know, he's a super villain and they tend to be a lot over the top. So he's just playing his role. Trickster is there on behalf of the rest of the travelers seeking permission to set up temporarily in Accord's area. And he's observing formality, as he says, and offers a offers him a sum and say, hey, you know, uh, we'd like to set up for 10 days. We'd be happy to pay you this amount of money. And then uh, along with a percentage of our takes and Accord says, hey, that's fine. But, you know, um, he lets Trickster know that he's going to investigate some of the numbers that he's provided him. 
where Trickster says, mm. hey, when we stayed in these other places, we played, we paid a, a, a stipend of this, this, and this to those people, and we'd like to offer you this for permission to stay in your area and, and to work in their your area. Accord says, okay, I tell you what, I'll let this go. I'll let you do this but I want you to do a task for me. And if you do, I'll waive your fee. So there's some negotiating going on here. And it, it goes along with Accord's mindset. You can read it that he's being kind of a a nitpicky pain in the butt, but he's used to everything being clarified and classified and categorized. Mm-hmm. So he mentions that, well, the reason that it's, not a lot of capes here is that there's not a lot of crime because I make sure we don't get anybody's attention by letting any crime sprees happen. I run a tight ship. Yeah. And so all the stuff that he says is just along that same tight ship thing. You know, he's like, all right, I've done the math. This is how you do it. This is what you pay me. And if you're an auditor type mentality, of course, you're going to check up on the numbers that somebody gives you. Sure. It's not that you're, thinking they're lying it's just that hey i'm an auditor you know that's that's what i do you saw me adjust my pen because it was two millimeters out of line i'm gonna i'm gonna make sure it all adds up that's right and things seem to be going okay a court is going to waive part of their fee as long as they do this job for him and go steal some tools from this local tinker named blasto everything's cool as i was saying right up until the time that Sundancer makes a very ill-advised, (laughs) ill-timed entrance into the room. And it's at that point, I think we really start to get a sense of how potentially dangerous this neurotic accord could be. Yeah. Everything is in its place. If something gets out of place, then it's, it's thrown away. If it was supposed to do this and it didn't do it, then it's cast aside. And so it doesn't matter if it's a paperclip or a person. This was supposed to be a meeting of just two people. Mm-hmm. You brought a second person. She dies. And and Trickster's like, uh, she didn't come in and set your desk on fire. She just popped her head in. Just relax. And so then he's got to tap dance around and, and try to figure out how to smooth things over. Yes. And I will give uh, Trickster credit for that because he thought on his feet pretty well. What's going to placate this guy? Okay, we've just had this major faux pas here. Sundancer has come in, wrecked this guy's world. How can I salvage this situation? And uh, I'm going to give him give him some props for handling that situation and, and putting the best, balancing the fact that he knows that Sundancer wouldn't have done it if it wasn't supremely urgent. And he knew what the urgent matter might have been, yet he knew he couldn't just diss a cord and say, I got to go by, you know? Yeah. And, and, and again, it's, it's that gaming mentality, right? Mm. I, it's mm-hmm. like, all right, I, I'm, I'm here at the boss. My initial strategy got messed up, but there's gotta be a way to salvage this. So he starts, yeah. Trying different things and not playing all of his cards. He just does stuff like leading type statements, like, I'll make amends, of course. And then that gets a court to say what those amends will look like. Not offering something, getting the other person to say. It. So uh, he does a good job of drawing that out until it gets to the point of, oh, and you got to kill your friend. That's like, all right, that we got to talk about. That's- yeah. <laughs> it is like, well, what if I prove to you that she's an agent of order and that she's just mm-hmm. responding to chaos that's been forced upon her? I. That was a that was a pretty smart move. I I like that recognition of the hand that was dealt him and how he played it. Yeah, I was surprised at how it turned out. I didn't perceive it going that way, but yeah, I thought that was you're appealing to the foibles of the person, the, mm-hmm. the peculiarities, and trying to connect with them on that level and say that, all right, yeah, it may seem like this tool is not doing what it's supposed to do, but let me show you that there's another way of interpreting this. Yes. And so he tells Sundancer the seriousness of the situation. Look, you've got to go placate this net. Go back in there, do a a, a ballet routine, do it the best you can, 
then bow out and apologize profusely. But the moment you mess up, or if he's not happy, torch the place. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't worry about him. He'll have an escape. Just torch the place and run. Yeah, it's a good plan. And Krause had touched on that earlier, where a court is is great at like battlefield strategy, but he's not a one on one fighter. Right. And so he'll have plans and and ways escape hatches and that kind of thing. But frankly, nobody could really hang with Sundancer anyway if she sure. if she took gloves off. But yeah, go in and try to make it work. If it doesn't, though, just yeah, turn on the sun and he'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> Trickster calls Oliver. This is where we get an inkling of what Noel has turned into before we get the mm. physical description. We get a little bit of tension building here. Uh, is that fair to say? Uh, we're first we find out that it's bad to have touched Noel for some reason, and then we find out that somehow Cody touching her has resulted in clones of him and grotesque clones at that. Yeah, and again, it's Cody, of course, mm -hmm. and he's always going to be the one that's pushing the envelope or, or messing around, screwing up plans. And he knows that he's not supposed to touch Noel, but he did three times. Yeah. And you're like, that doesn't sound that bad, but then, yeah, then you start seeing it from Krause's point of view or trickster's point of view. Now that he's running around and trying to get there, you know, I've got to minimize the damage. And how did he even do it three times? How could he be so stupid? You know, and so you're right. like, wow, this must be really bad. And then he sees the target and it's this, yeah, disgusting clone, like you said, limping along and attacking everybody and uh, just grotesque and misshapen. And, you know, any any bad adjective you can think of uh, it probably smells bad, too. Yeah. <laughs> But he's just attacking everything, and then it turns out that it's a clone of Cody somehow, the shape of clone. Right. And he's looking for, for Trickster. Uh, Perdition, I believe, is Cody's cape name. Cape name. And this clone is looking for, for Trickster. Trickster spots him first, and they end up having a fight, as it were. Trickster ends up shooting him. All this perdition clone wants to do is kill him and his power. Oh yeah. At one point Krauss is wondering what's the variation. Mm. I think it says, uh, sometimes the powers would be different. Most of the time going by uh, precedent, they were stronger. Trickster was left to wonder how perdition's powers had changed duration range, the amount of time reversed. And so these are all the things he's having to consider. They aren't exact clones uh, or copies of of Cody. Things are different. So there's something in these intervene, intervening months has gone on to where the group knows that when Noel gets touched and she creates this copy, things will be different mentally and, and physically and as far as their powers go. Yeah, and it makes sense. You know, if it's the physical appearance is mutated, then probably the underlying stuff is as well. But yeah, it's creepy that it's happened this often. I'm sure the first time was accidental, but mm -hmm. it's like, why would you keep doing it? Picture that scene from an old Simpsons show where Lisa's trying to do an experiment with uh, behavioral modification, and mm -hmm. uh, she's got a little thing that zaps Bart, and he just keeps grabbing it over, over <laughs> again. Ow, it did it again. Ow, it did it again. Ow, it did it again. And you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, that's what's going to happen. But who knows? You know, maybe Cody is is wanting Kraus to be taken out, and he's willing to have this horrible stuff happen, as messed up as that seems. But it's pretty bad. And he, yeah, as you said, Kraus is trying to figure all this out while being attacked and trying to make sure all the innocent bystanders aren't wiped out as well. So after a few tries, he's able to get the drop on this Perdition clone and shoot him. And he teleports himself and this clone to a vehicle. They, he grabs a purse and takes their vehicle, ends up back at the house. And they're inside the house. They've laid out the three clones. And this is where 
where Kraus hears from the others that Cody had touched her three times and that Cody's actually hurt pretty badly, broken arm, broken leg. And the only thing, reason that Kraus can figure that he did this was that he was going to go in there to try to kill Noel, but it, it doesn't work. She, at some point or other, had tried to starve herself, had tried to make herself die of thirst, but that didn't work either. She tried to end it herself, and she ended up going berserk, and from what Kraus knew, she ended up killing, what was it, 40 people? 40, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. You know, she's definitely got this horrible compulsion going on with everything else, and everybody has to describe how they took care of the different clones that were out there Mm -hmm. but yeah noel doesn't want to be doing this any more than anybody else wants to be doing it but it looks like there's no way to stop it so um, now i'm sure just like we speculated with crawler you know i'm I'm guessing sun sundance are good at incinerator but you know who wants to do that to your friend and they were really close and right and again they're these aren't like 50 year old people who have tons of worldly experience these are young folks and she's probably known noel as long as a lot of people and so can't just snuff them out as horrible as horrible as the alternative is this is where we get talk of the promise that they made the pact that they made right kraus is outside trying to think marissa shows back up explains what went down with the cord and how he said she wasn't perfect, but he could see what Kraus meant by her being an agent of order, I believe is the phrase. Accord puts them in touch with good old Mr. Coyle. Yep. The circle finally closes. Yes. We finally we get to see how dots. they yeah, how they ended up in the employ of the would be king of Brockton Bay. He promised them quite a lot at the start. And so you can see where you think back to the moment right before Skitter took out Coil. You can see where Trickster, he's got a lot li- uh, riding on Coil living. As right. you noted, this is one of those, those dots that get connected. Yeah. And you wonder about the Seamurg again, then, you know, where how many of these ripples were. Once Cross was put on this path to become trickster and to do mm-hmm. all these things, you know, is this all is this all part of that, or is is Noel the the guided missile? Seem seems like it might be her now. So, but yeah, it's it's good to finally get get everything tied up in a nice little package, at least to a certain extent. So after he gets off the phone with Coil and gets the um, the offer of employment as well as the possibility of solving their problems. This is where Krauss goes in to talk to Noel, and we get this mm. ugh, this god-awful description of the condition, her actual shape. Again, it's, it's the stuff of nightmares here. Yeah, it, it kind of made me think of that uh, the villainess from uh, Little Mermaid. Oh, um, um, where she Ursula. had the bottom half. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The bottom half was the giant squid kind of thing in your octopus. And, but on, on top, she kind of looked normal. Mm-hmm. But this is just way worse. I mean, there's like a hand and a thumb and just, yeah, there's just all sorts of weird, horrible things going on here down Yeah, uh, Wild Bull Wild is not holding back in, in the description <laughs> of this. I mean, right. you think back to Night from the earlier arcs and when they, when Skitter was fighting them and, how we didn't get a, a a good look. We didn't actually get a look at all at night because you had to not be looking at her. And the best description mm-hmm. we got was uh, was when Skitter's bugs, I think it was, could feel her multi jointed legs bending the wrong way or whatever. Here, oh, Wild right, Wild Bull is not holding back, and it's 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 grim. It's ugly. Well, and I also had kind of a flashback to uh, Nilbog. You know, oh, oh, yeah. Where there's like these the spawning going on of these misshapen mm-hmm. mutants, and and she, you know, Noelle's all tweaked out and everything, and so it's just yeah, it's very nightmarish. And every time you think it can't get any worse, it just gets worse. 
Yeah, she doesn't expel waste. Her body just reinforces what's already grown. The team is wondering if she's becoming an inbringer, or at least that's what she thinks what, what might be happening. Right. Yeah. Krauss goes in and talks to her and tells her what Coyle has to offer them. And it's hopeful, and it's actually kind of a an emotional moment for them. Krauss still looks at her, and he sees Noel. He doesn't see you know, he sees the the girl that he cared for. He realizes she's in bad shape, mm-hmm. but his his concern is trying to to get her better and then ultimately try to get get everyone back home. And he offers her this carrot, and that's how we come to find out, or that's how we find out how they ended up in Coyle's base with Noel behind two vault doors inside a an enclosure. And then we have a, a skip. The story picks up with Krauss, or pardon me, Trickster, coming to consciousness on the beach. How did you like how Wild Bull lays the story out here? We start off this essentially massive interlude for the travelers, and it circles all the way around to Trickster coming to consciousness having after having been tased. Yeah, this was... I could have used a little bit more connection here. Mm-hmm. This was a little jarring on this last shift, but it's nice again that it's all kind of connecting back up. And, and like you said, it's one giant interlude that's kind of reconnected everything. So, yeah. And here we have it. Jess is in her wheelchair out on the sand. Sundancer is laid out beside him. Kraus looks and sees his memory comes back to him. He sees the, the spot where coil originally was. And we are left with the sound of the waves crashing on the beach, the seagulls fighting over morsels of gore and Mm. Krauss staring at the stain. And that takes us to the, to the end of the arc. Let's see here. Let's let me interject before we move on. So my impression of this arc has really shifted from my original read. Like I said, I think I blew through this one. I may have skipped back and checked a few things, but I was more worried about the main part of the story. But because of some stuff that I know, some connective tissue that's waiting for you to discover, my appreciation for this arc has improved immensely. And I, mm. I think I get some of what uh, some of what the other commenters were saying. So, yeah, I think I just kind of eh, was nonplus about it originally. But now I, I, I think my appreciation for it has really improved, really gone up. And I really like this now. Having said that, I want to read our question from Megafire. And then why don't you uh, respond to that and roll in, use that as a, as a springboard to give us your overall impressions for the arc as well. So from Megafire, uh, well, so, go, go ahead, bud. One, one, one thing quick. Um, mm-hmm. So Coil, the, the ultimate carrot was that because of his power and probably Dinah's, he stipulated that the Seamer couldn't, was blocked somehow. Some of her power was negated. And so I think that was a really interesting twist in there. And that really sealed the deal for the travelers because that had been the thing that had been haunting them, you know, that they're predestined for whatever crap is coming. Yeah. And here they're saying that, well, maybe not. I'm interested to find out if that is just coil playing them and, and telling them what they need to hear. Or if it's if it's legit, it, it seems like he was just playing them, but who knows? All right. Anyway, just wanted to throw that in there. Oh, actually, I did want to th- one more thing. Yeah. So in the description of Noel, as I'm going back through that, and mm-hmm. you had mentioned that she didn't expel waste. Right. That reminded me of the surgery she was going through, and she was going to need a colostomy bag. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if that. Because she was in that dire physical state, that contributed to how messed up her transformation has been. She's basically her own kind of colostomy bag. That's pretty disgusting. But no, I get you. And who knows? Again, that's part of that whole that whole massive 
S storm that went into mm. her consuming this file. Right. Her mental state, her having been in counseling, her probably having mm. some kind of uh, eating disorder. Eating disorder. Yeah. The physical state she's in from being in a building that's mm. been tossed from one world to another and then having a bunch of computers and monitors land on top of her was Noel, the guided missile, as you said, uh, that Seamurg ultimately wanted to turn loose. Who knows? Mm. But it's worth considering. Yep. All right. Sorry to. No, not at all. Good stuff all the way, bud. Good stuff. Speculate at will. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And now we hear from Megafire 7. This is what Megafire says. Migration is generally considered to be a bit controversial in that it's such a departure from Taylor's story, but I've always appreciated them when doing a more analytical read. By the time you answer this question, you'll have finished the arc, so I'm free to ask. How has this arc fleshed out your understanding of the world and the story? And how has it recontextualized all the little tidbits we found out about the travelers before? Um, take that and, um, answer it as you will, and then roll over into your, your overall impressions of the arc. Okay. Um, I was, as I said, at the beginning of this very jarred by, all right, where is this going? This, this does seem like a very, what the heck kind of deal, you know, this is just out of nowhere, but then, you know, the pieces start to fall into place and, as we said at the beginning of the podcast, it's it's really neat the way it's so cohesive. You could tell that, you know, sometimes when you're working on a project, you leave it for a while, you come back and you kind of pick up the pieces, but it's not maybe as solid. Mm-hmm. And you have to kind of tweak it as, you, as you're coming back to it. But this, you can tell, it was just kind of all one train of thought. And then to, to have it kind of say, all right, like uh, Megafire is saying here, this is where the travelers are coming from. You know, when when they were doing this, when they're having this interaction amongst themselves or with a different mm-hmm. group, this is why it was the way it was. This is why Noel was part of the group, but nobody ever got to hang out with her. And there was this underlying tension whenever Noel was brought up. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think... I think this answered a lot. I really liked how it, it put things in context as Megafire 7 was uh, implying there. So that does help uh, kind of align everything and link it all together. And I I could see where it was controversial, but I, I really think it was well-written. And there were a lot of loose threads out there, and this tied them all together. So that worked out really well. As far as my overall impression of the arc, yeah, I liked it. It barreled along, and it was super creepy at times, but it it really was a neat, neat the way it played out. And as you said, you know, it starts off bleak, and then it just keeps getting more bleak, and you don't think (laughs) it can get any more bleak, and then it does. And so, but you're somehow that you know, Wild Bo writes it so that there's still this tiny glimmer of hope. You know, you mentioned Lord of the Rings earlier. It's it's the same way in that, you know, where they're just, you know, they start off with a group and then there's betrayal and the group fragments. And then, you know, what many would consider are the weakest characters are left with the biggest job. And right. how is that going to happen? And just, you know, one thing after another, the cards are really stacked against them. And this this is even worse. But somehow you're still left. Well, maybe it'll work out. You know, maybe. Noel won't eat the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, bro. Tattletail's talking about air raid sirens. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And the slaughterhouse, you know, Dinah was saying that chances are the world will be gone pretty much in a few years. Well, that could be Noel's doing. We'll just have to see. And now it's time for Andy to announce his choice for key character of the arc, whether a hero or villain. Cape or civilian, Andy will identify the characters that stood out to him, whether it's for good or ill. Andy, who's your selection and why? 
Well, I mean, Krauss was definitely the the central character, and so I was tempted to go with him. And then Noel, everything was kind of driven around what was going on with Noel, and uh, you know, she was kind of the catalyst for the rivalry a little bit between Cody and Krauss. So I was tempted to go with her, but in the end, I have to pick Seymour. Ooh, because she might be the the original straw that stirred the drink. You know, it's hard to underestimate her power. Mm -hmm. And so many things fell into place the way they did so that even though there's this just horrible, super risky choice, they end up having to take it. The readers wouldn't agree as you're going through it. It's like, well, yeah, that's that's the only real chance they have Mm -hmm. is drinking the potions, you know? And so how far back do you go to see where she, uh, where the Seamer orchestrated this? And so it's very interesting though, that she's not OP there. There Mm -hmm. are people who can disrupt her ability to see what's coming and disrupt things. And so it's tempting to, to think that, Oh my gosh, there's just no way to get get around this. It's horrible. But Wild Bo provides an escape hatch. Mm-hmm. And so I find that very tantalizing how those two things will work. You know, the powers of people who disrupt the ability to see the future and then Seamurg's web cast far and wide and and how insidious and how how deep does it go. So Seamurg is my choice for character of the arc. All right. Sounds good, but I think that's a first for her. And that may be your first inbringer choice. Can't remember. Anyway. <laughs> so that's it for now, everyone. Thanks once again for joining us. And just as a heads up, we all know the the holiday season will be coming soon. And we'll keep you posted on any effects, any changes to our recording schedule um, as they come up. Enjoy your time as the summer winds down and uh, we get ready to roll into fall. Uh, Until next time, take care. And just to echo what Keith said, thanks so much for coming along on the ride with us. You know, I'm I'm glad we didn't have to have Trickster teleport you in. You're actually, you know, voluntarily (laughs) choosing to listen to this. So that's really cool. I'm loving the story. And each time I read, I'm, uh, even more blown away by Wild Bo's uh, abilities at writing. So that's really neat to see that. Until next time, try to stay out of the way of the Edinburghers. Thanks for joining us in this video. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not from their self-titled debut CD, You can find more information in the link down below. Catch you later.